say, well, I know that as a council member, this is the policy that I make, this is what should be changed. But as a young person, I, I can sit and say, I see that, but I don't understand that yet. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, part of what, what, what you are saying and saying to those who have the experience is that um, share it. Right. <laughs> share that experience with us. It's uh, also involve us, you know, include oh, us in, in what's happening and what's going on. Uh, that some of us may not want to be uh, included because we just don't know, we don't understand. Our, and at times I think, and this is not just an issue, and I, Nancy, I think you, you might agree, it's not just an issue for young people, I think it's an issue for all people that sometimes there's a kind of, not legalese, but there's a kind of uh, talk lease or whatever, that goes on with elected officials that over time uh, they almost forget how to break it down and communicate it in such a way that other people understand what's going on. And I, I think that uh, commission meetings, council meetings are a uh, teaching moment, they're a teaching opportunity to do that for, uh, for the citizens because I've always said it and I believe it that, um, you know, we have cities, we have towns, etc. because there are people there. If there were no people, there would be no reason for, uh, or would there be a city or a town or whatever. Uh, but because the people are there, and if you care about what they think, if you care about uh, bringing, uh, let's say, bringing them along, so to speak, in terms of ensuring that they understand what's going on, ensuring that they understand the process of how to get things done, and ensuring that in that understanding they're given the opportunity to get things done. Uh, I think all of that is what's key and what's important. And uh, Laris had the opportunity as an intern to actually go to, um, to meetings all over the city with different age groups, with different um, uh, cultural and et ethnic um, ethnicities as well. Uh, he's had the opportunity of listening to, at the commission meetings, uh, people who want something and want to do something for the city, and those who may not want it done, uh, at least not in their area, not in their backyard. Uh, and a lot of those are things that are dealt with. But I think um, another thing that I kind of hear you saying, but you didn't, you didn't um, maybe articulate, is that uh, when, when people share with you, when people uh, bring you in, you want it to be honest, you want it to be right, you, 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 you want it to be uh, in such a way that you are able to not only understand it but you, and be included, but you're also able to um, realistically give and contribute something to that ongoing conversation. I, yeah, I think that when I meet and I agree, I would hope that what you bring to me is the truth, and, you know, going to meetings and understanding that different people have different sides, that that's a great way to, to understand that in life that there will be more challenges that we all have to face. So mm -hmm. I think I'm able to see that, and you've given me a great opportunity to not only see it, but also act in it, you know, mm -hmm. by reaching out to not just the community here, but wherever I go as a better person. So. Mm -hmm. If I may, one of the things I think I heard, too, was that the both sides should respect each other. In other words, the youth should also be trying to hear what the older people are saying because of their experience mm -hmm. in education. So it, it works both ways. Right, the right. Older people shouldn't not listen to the youth just because they are younger. And, and then the youth shouldn't. Exactly. Not. Shouldn't have a, uh, an attitude or whatever toward the, the older people. And we, I think it, should, it goes both ways. It does. Uh, respect. It does. And we both, as different age groups, we should hold each other accountable as well for oh, our absolutely. and to be civically more engaged. Mm -hmm. Because you bringing me along the ride, I've come along the ride, but when I'm done, I still must enact. Mm -hmm. So you have to hold that to me, and I must hold that to you as well. When I'm done, when we're done with our journey, you still must enact. Mm -hmm. it's, we're not over, it's not done. There's still more for us to do. And maybe that's, we still need to hold each other accountable for our actions no matter our age groups, no matter where we come from, what we do. Absolutely. And I think a part of it, too, is that, and Nancy, uh, you can comment on this as well, that I think a part of it is that once you're given uh, uh, that additional information or whatever, uh, and you, you learn more in terms of whatever it is that's going on, 
and uh, you're included, then you really should take advantage of that and not just, okay, now I've got the information, I'm just going to sit here and just keep it to myself and not really use it to either help myself or help others. And I think there is a level of responsibility that, uh, that we have, uh, that people have as citizens, that they have as elected officials, that they have as appointed officials. There is uh, not just the expectation, but there also should be uh, that acceptance of the responsibility such that you are not only held accountable, but you act uh, in an accountable way. Uh, that what is expected uh, is not only fulfilled, but also that because you care and because hopefully there's that passion, and I know, Nancy, you have, um, for what it is that you want to do, what it is you're trying to do, that, that that passion drives you to not only want to do, but to do your best and to do it not just for yourself, but you're doing it for other people. And, uh, and that's what government has to be about. It has to be about the greater good, the better good, and how we take what we have in terms of experience in bringing others along, involving them, uh, you know, ensuring that they're included and that they're included in such a way that it's, uh, all, there are always teachable moments and opportunities to demonstrate uh, what it is that you've learned in those moments and really put it to work. I couldn't agree more. That's, uh it really is the, the difference between a really good elected official. I'll, I'll use Glenn Ritchie as an example since that's the seat that you're running for. He has been so involved in the community in so many ways, aside from his elected position, which he kind of fell into, as you well know. Mm -hmm. This wasn't something he's been aspiring to for years and years or something. So he, he's a great example of how a mayor or, or another elected official gives back to the community. And in a much lesser way, I would like to think I've done a similar job in having given back to the community through the service organizations I belong to, mm -hmm. the town, my involvement with various organizations and activities in the town and the greater community, schools. Yeah, and and I have people who ask me, so what are you doing now type thing, and uh, even having, having done a lot and been, you know, had the titles and, and really giving a lot. Uh, that giving continues. It continues in such a way that um, we, as, as you said, Larry, it's not just you and it's not just about you. It's the fact that you're bringing others on board as well. Because at a certain point in time, all of us will have finished our journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it will be time for others to have actually, uh, to, if they've been you know, prepared and gained the experience and been able to actually demonstrate that experience, uh, to actually kind of take on the mantle and, and go from there. And as you've said, that's the sign of, of true leadership. That's the sign really of, uh, of a person that is doing what they should be doing in an office, that you're actually bring other, bringing others along uh, in that manner. Um, so that we don't run out of time in terms of the Ponce case or the Ponce issue, uh, when you were mayor uh, and you wrote a, an article, uh, letter to the editor, involving the Ponce case and, and what had gone on and trying to enlighten people. And then after I read that, then it was like the very next day or maybe the day after that the News Journal actually had some information about what had happened in regards to, again, the Ponce case. Um, which had to do with, uh, I was supposed uh, a, a developer and also uh, what citizens' petitions that they uh, initiated and the like, but rather than confusing it because you're the person who was there and who knows, <laughs> let me just turn it over to you and ask that you kind of shed light, if you could kind of set the stage of, of what happened, how it happened, and then, then give, you know, your... Um, your, not your interpretation, but uh, share with them what this means to you as a person who, who was there and knew it and saw it and lived it, you know, at this point. I'll give you my most unbiased version <laughs> and that I can. Uh, the Johnsons started buying that property in 2004, and that property would be the property that includes Down the Hatch Restaurant and Sea Love Boatyard. So if you go all the way down Atlanta to the four-way stop sign at Beach Street, and turn right and go all the way to the river, it's that property that I'm referring to. 
They named the property after they had acquired all the parcels, Pacific, Pacific Preserve, and came to the town and presented some ideas of what they would like for the town to consider allowing them to do on the property. The town had been discussing for a while that that should be our town center because it was already primarily commercial. The old Florida club was there. It's been torn down since. The Docksider restaurant was there, down the hatch, and as I say, the boat yard. So that was a pretty obvious central location. It was not central, but it's a place where we could group together some small businesses to, as the vision says, provide access to small-scale businesses surviving the citizens' needs. Along with allowing those uh, businesses to be developed, we recognized that there was going to be some economic disincentive for the Johnsons in that the, the residents themselves probably wouldn't be able to totally support those businesses. So we were engaged in discussions with them at both the planning commission and then the council levels as far as allowing them to have um, some dry book storage, some mixed use housing, and some private estate type homes on the southernmost part of the river, which, or rather the property, which is right on the river and is absolutely gorgeous. It slopes down to the water, it's uh, heavily treed and just absolutely beautiful. The discussions went very, very well for several years. As I said, it wasn't just the council, it wasn't, certainly wasn't just me. It was the planning commission first, and then after they transmitted the plan to the council, we got actively engaged in the discussions. I will say the Johnsons had come to various members of us over the years and discussed their plans. Uh, we were working very in a very collaborative manner, which Big John doesn't like me to use big words like that, but I think you get it. <laughs> and um, everything seemed to be progressing toward satisfying the needs of the Manatee Protection Plan and the working waterfront that the state had mandated that we address and that the council had voted five to zero to support. Well, at one point, the citizens in the immediate area decided they didn't want the big boat storage, which I think they envisioned as being similar to the open and noisy storage that's at, in the harbor, for instance. We knew that that wasn't going to be what was envisioned for the Pasetti property. That was supposed to be a, a, an enclosed, fire suppressed, noise reduced facility that we didn't think would be much of a problem for the neighbors. However, the neighbors had a different idea and got together enough people to sign a petition to put on the ballot in November of 2008 a charter amendment to the charter of the town of Ponce Inlet, which as you know is essentially the constitution of a town or city. Right. So <clears throat> that being the case, the charter is the ruling document. Nothing can conflict with the charter. So when we were, we had already passed the comprehensive use, land use plan on first reading with the dry book storage included. But we decided to delay second reading until the charter amendment had been voted on so that the comprehensive use plan and the charter would not be in conflict. The charter amendment actually did pass, although unfortunately a judge later ruled that to have been an illegal petition. So the changes that it purported to put into the charter actually should never have gotten there because it wasn't legal. So, however, because of the fact that it had passed, we went ahead and passed the comprehensive land use plan on second reading. It's a long story, I know, but it's important for yeah. the listener to understand how we got where we are. Well, then a new council got elected also in November of 2008. I had had to resign as mayor in order to run for the county council. And uh, three new people got elected. And they proceeded to basically halt any future changes to that property that would have been necessary for the moratorium that was currently on the property to have been lifted. So that went on for another year and a half, during which time two new members to the council got elected, and then they had five to zero, basically. And it got to the point where the Pasetti owners, the Johnsons, felt that they had been deprived of all uses of their property other than the restaurant, and they then proceeded to a lawsuit. Mm. So that's how the lawsuit came about. Um, if anybody recently read the town did lose that lawsuit. Judge uh, Richard Parsons ruled that, uh, I'm sorry, William Parsons ruled that uh, 
the actions of the